there's a crime. Detectives follow the clues. They get close, but then they reach the water. So they call in the underwater criminal investigator. That's Mike Barry. Hold on, this is Mike Barry. I dive in very strange places looking for very strange things. Mike has been an underwater criminal investigator for 35 years. How easy is it to get rid of a murder weapon? All it is is a flick of the wrist. In someone's mind, that murder weapon is forever gone. They have no idea there are people like me crazy enough to go down there and search. Law enforcement depends on guys like Mike to preserve and recover evidence. Your three cores in uh, underwater criminal investigation is body recovery, vehicle recovery, and evidence recovery. I get called about twice a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. And when a call comes in, Hello? chances are Mike's in for a challenge. Some of these locations are absolutely disgusting. Our typical dive site is dark, it's deep, it's cold, it's full of obstructions, it's contaminated. The danger is there when you get in the water. You know, I've had murderers tell me, you know, you'll never find it. I said, well, we'll see. Go ahead, diver one. I've located the weapon. Four, diver one. There's nothing like finding the target. When your hand hits it and you feel it and you realize you've got it, for a public safety diver, uh, there's no greater thing. And when he's out there searching for a body? I look at it as an honor because you realize the importance of what you're asked to do. There's a family and there's no closure until you bring them up. You know, not every diver can do this. Not everybody has it in their DNA. It's what I was meant to do. I couldn't think of anything better to do with my life. Truth is, I can't wait for the next call to help someone in some way, either to bring closure or to bring a conviction. Bombing students have to understand the importance that every face is different. Morgan Freeman, square face. Abraham Lincoln, oblong face. Kanye West, oval face. My name is James Edward Smith, Jr. I'm an instructor and clinical director at Dallas Institute of Funeral Service. And I currently instruct restorative art Restorative art class provides a skill set to be able to take a deceased person who has experienced trauma to the head and or face and restore those features in that face so that the family may have an option for an open casket viewing or visitation. In the fifth quarter, the students are tasked with reproducing a sculpture of a person that they choose and the anatomy has to be accurate Students generally pick celebrities, you know, their popular faces, and students uh, tend to want to try to re recreate those. For my restorative art project, I did Jennifer Aniston. Jack White. Viola Davis. Frida Kahlo. I decided to do David Lynch. Taking on the assignment requires each of the students to understand the proportions for the features of the face here in school because it translates to what may happen in the actual preparation room. It is an acquired skill. The more you practice, the more proficient, the better you're gonna become. The expectation of the family is that this is something we can sometimes do right away, but we have to take into account the amount of trauma that the face has sustained. We need to have as much care when handling the deceased as if they were in the hospital under the care of a doctor. I am uh, very passionate about restorative art because I believe it's important for people to have the best memory picture possible when it's time to say goodbye. We're tasked as embalmers to help families have the option, no matter the cause of death, to say goodbye to mom or dad or brother or sister.
Welcome to the National Fish and Wildlife Forensics Laboratory in Ashland, Oregon. Our laboratory works very much like a police crime lab uh, in that we identify evidence and we try to link suspect, victim, and crime scene together with that evidence. The big difference is that our victim is a non-human animal. I'm Ken Goddard and the director of this laboratory. When our agent sees evidence at a border, a custom center, wherever, that evidence will be packaged and shipped to us. Our job is to analyze evidence collected for wildlife law enforcement investigations. Our laboratory primarily supports wildlife laws in general, specifically the Endangered Species Act. Sadly, we're the only full-service crime lab for wildlife in the world. We'd like not to be, but that's our reality. The illicit wildlife trade is huge. It's probably in the neighborhood of 17, 18, 19 billion dollars a year. We're certainly impacting the trade, but it's a desperately difficult job. Here are some of the scientists that help us solve crimes against animals. Our veterinary pathologist is Dr. Becky Kagan. My job is to autopsy all of the animals that come in here and try to figure out why they died. Today I have uh, two birds. They're both bald eagles. They're wild animals. They're found dead. My job is to figure out was there a crime involved. We can do CT scanning here at the lab. We take photographs. We do alternate light source exam to help us solve the puzzle of why this animal died. One aspect of our work that's typical of a crime lab is we compare a known against an unknown. For us to identify, let's say, a feather or maybe to identify the bones, we would compare that against tissue from a known animal or to a skeleton. And the fellow responsible for our huge collection is Johnny French. Our collection is 35,000 specimens, give or take. Everything that we have here has either been donated or was seized in customs. The uniqueness of our collection helps us kind of keep abreast of what we see in the wildlife trade. Most of the time we have to remove meat from bone in order to examine specimens or to get them into our reference collection. Easiest way to do that is take the carcass and chuck it in the flesh-eating beetle tank. After the beetles have finished with the carcass that we threw in there, we'll wash them a couple of times and then the bones are ready for the collection. Heading up our genetics section is Dr. Mary Curtis. The genetics team is important to the functioning of the lab because we look at items that other parts of the lab can't identify. Items that might be crafted to the point where you can't tell what their origin is. So we have access to over 40,000 individual tissue samples in our reference collection that we use to identify different species. One of the more interesting people in our lab is Dr. Pepper Trail, our ornithologist. I'm an ornithologist, a bird expert, so I look at bird evidence and use reference specimens to compare to evidence items to confirm the identifications. The kinds of evidence that we receive is incredibly varied. We receive everything from complete dead carcasses in good condition to just bags of bones. I've identified over 750 species in the course of my work here, which would be a pretty good life list for a lot of birders. The magnitude of the international wildlife trade is staggering. Every day into our laboratory comes uh, the remains of dead animals from around the world, and someone needs to provide the information needed to bring wildlife criminals to justice. It's sometimes a sad job, but it's a very important job and I'm proud to be part of it. I believe that the word cold cases is wrong because it could be perhaps something that's in a drawer somewhere in an office, but their families hasn't forgotten them and they're still looking for them. And I just want to do my best to, to help. When authorities have failed to identify the remains of a body, there is very little hope of closure for these John and Jane Doe's. But every year, an enterprising studio of student artists use their knowledge of the human form to try and breathe life into these cold cases. Here we're doing a forensic reconstruction of a real case, trying to get it as close as he used to look like when he was alive. 
so we can identify him. We are given a 3D print, not the real skull. We use it as a framework so we can reconstruct the anatomy of the individual. First we start adding the muscles on the framework given by the bone and then we try to complete those things that are not so clear like the ear or the mouth. Right now I'm working on a Caucasian white man between 40 to 60 years old. There are indications that he lost his teeth when he was alive and uh, his bones are telling me all that. These lifelike models are provided to authorities, often reinvigorating investigations and bringing much needed closure to loved ones. After my first experience last year, I was lucky enough that the person was identified and I got this beautiful letter from the family members saying thank you. When we see this process, it feels almost like you're resuscitating someone. But I know that beyond that, where you're resuscitating is the life of those families that are looking for this person.